Greetings everyone, now let me tell you about a train journey that happened on a cold grey day in September 190 years ago exactly. A journey set to be a breakthrough moment in human technology up until that point. A journey dressed in pomp and ceremony, billed as a gateway to a new and exciting future for the world. But it was also a journey full of tragedy and drama as much as it was pride and triumph. It was a journey of bleak northern rain, controversy, hardship and yes, even death. The Liverpool to Manchester railway line was built as the first intercity passenger railway service anywhere in the world. But it was also going to be the first to use steam locomotion regularly on a large scale, with timetables for both passenger and goods trains. But with locomotives still in their early days, nobody quite knew if the technology was up to the task. To find out, the financiers of the railway held a great locomotive competition, which was held here at Rainhill along the line, where several different designs were pitted against each other, including this, 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 and this, with a design by engineer George Stevenson coming out the clear winner. This was the famous Rocket, filmed here on a rare visit back to Manchester in 2019. And so they had the engines and they had the willpower, but this railway wasn't going to be a simple construction project. In fact, it'd be one of the most complex engineering challenges faced in Britain up until that time. The proposed route proved a serious challenge with a number of difficult engineering problems, along a 31 mile long line including a 2 mile long, 25 metre deep rock cutting at Olive Mount, a crossing of the unstable peat bog at Chat Moss, and a viaduct across the Sankey Valley. Now we saw in the last video where the journey started, which was Edge Hill Cutting, this amazing transformative area just uh, south of Liverpool city centre. And it was here beneath the Grand Moorish Arch, which is no longer there, that crowds gathered to see the lucky passengers mingling in excitement and nervousness, ready to board the carriages. Here, the carriages were coupled to steam locomotives and began their journey towards Manchester. Now on the opening day, one of the passengers was the Duke of Wellington, the Prime Minister. Now there was a procession of eight engines all modelled after Rocky, including one called the Planet. There was even a carriage dedicated just to a brass band who were supposed to play throughout the journey all day long. Now, a little known fact is that the lead engine that day was not actually the rocket, but an engine called Northumbrian, because it was larger and seemed less likely to suffer from problems. It was this one that the Prime Minister travelled in, and on a separate track to the others, so that he wouldn't be delayed if the others had problems. Now, the first notable thing that the passengers would have seen was not far out of Liverpool, at somewhere called Olive Mount. Here, George Stevenson had been forced to make another deep cutting into the sandstone to get around the problem caused by the area's uneven land. At 24 metres deep and originally 6 metres wide, the 3 kilometre cutting had been an engineering migraine for Stevenson and the workmen who had actually had to do the digging and blasting. Still, the formidable cutting was made and the thousands of tons of sandstone was used to make embankments for the next problem waiting just a few miles further along the line the wide valley of the Sankey Brook. Before they arrived there, however, they had time to make one more world first. In this case, the world's first train on train collision and it occurred just outside St. Helens, 13 miles into the journey. So the front wheel of the lead engine, the Phoenix, suddenly bumped off the track, sending the engine um, off the track into the clay where thankfully it ground to a gradual halt. That was a minor accident, a minor uh, incident, if you like, um, and it wouldn't have really made much of a difference except 
The engine behind didn't see it in time and braked at the last minute. The two collided and all the passengers on board, both engines, were jolted. Now quickly the engine was put back onto the track and everybody was underway again, there was no injuries but this was not the type of incident that Stevenson and the railway financiers wanted on their opening day. Nobody had really considered that an engine could spontaneously leave a track and the dangers involved in that, especially not with a viaduct coming up. Now the Sankey Brook flows north to south along the valley and back then there used to be a canal there too. Now Stevenson and his team of engineers had to figure out a way of crossing the valley and two watercourses without sending the trains up and down steep cumbersome hills. And so they built this, the Sankey Viaduct and another of the world's first, in this case the world's first large scale railway viaduct. Now if you've watched more of my videos on this channel you'll know I'm a little bit obsessed with railway viaducts. But this, this has got to be number one, this is right up there definitely. It's just immense and to think it was built in just two years and it's still in use today. Now this is arguably the most impressive thing about the Liverpool Manchester line. Not its age or its novelty or its historical status, but this big bloody great stone viaduct. Now of course these days we're used to seeing this type of thing. It's just part of the background, it's very commonplace. But imagine being here in 1830 when this was first built, when it was first introduced to the world. It was a modern wonder of the world. People around here, people everywhere had never seen anything like it, save for a few canal aqueducts here and there. But this, the scale of it, just uncomparable. I mean, how exciting is that? Imagine living around here at that time and seeing this huge stone structure towering across the valley that you'd always known with steam engines chugging up and down between Liverpool and Manchester, miles and miles away. The world suddenly opens up and it opens up like this. Wow. So the Sankey Viaduct has nine arches. The third one there, the third one from that end, um, being the one where the canal passed underneath. In fact, it's a footpath today. But the canal company insisted that the viaduct um, give enough clearance to the Mersey flatboats, which used to go up and down the canal all the time. Now, the Mersey flatboats uh, are those with very tall sails. And so Stevenson, what he had to do is build these huge embankments. You can see just a, a bit of one there. These huge embankments out of clay, which would give enough clearance. And it meant that the railway line didn't actually lose any height as it crossed the valley here. But also them really tall arches there would give enough clearance uh, for all the boats to pass underneath and the railway just to keep on going. Not far from Sankey was Parkside Station, here just east of where Newton Le Willow Station is today. This was a tiny little stopping point, consisting of just a few sheds and a water point, and it was here that the procession stopped so that the trains could take on more water. And it was here that disaster struck. Now, the passengers weren't supposed to leave their carriages for safety reasons, but many of them were dignitaries and used to getting what they wanted. So, unfortunately, a few of them got out to stretch their legs. One of them was a Liverpool MP called William Huskisson, who crossed the tracks, who left his own carriage and crossed the tracks to go speak to the Prime Minister. Um, and unfortunately, he walked in front of the path of rocket, which was slowly making its way down the track.
which brings me to here, the middle of nowhere, uh, which is the site of Parkside Station. Uh, now this behind me is a memorial to Huskisson and it was erected many, many years later. Unfortunately, this is the back of it. You can't actually go around and see the front because this is still a live railway line and very, very dangerous, obviously. Um, but if you're sharp on the train from Liverpool to Manchester, if you look out the window, um, you might catch a glimmer of it uh, speeding by. But unfortunately, this is as close as I can get. But with so many people gathered along the route all the way to Manchester, it was decided that the best thing to do was to keep going ahead with the journey, despite the Prime Minister's objections to it. So Stevenson uncoupled three of the four carriages attached to the Northumbrian and took the injured Huskisson by train to the nearest place of sanctuary, which was in Eccles, and then carried on to Manchester to find a surgeon and proper medical equipment. He did so and then returned much later with the help. Sadly, Huskisson died later anyway. Now technically that means that the first journey completed that day was by George Stevenson on the Northumbrian alone and not the big procession we all imagine it to be. But it does mean that with only one carriage attached and the engine running flat out, a world speed record was briefly um, attained at almost 40 miles per hour. Now Huskisson's death was not the first railway fatality, even though many people think it is. Uh, it was just simply the most high profile but it does often distract from the many men who lost their lives building the railway. The navvies who cut the, the cuttings in Liverpool, who built the Sankey Canal, and who are about to tackle the next problem en route, a massive area of marshland known as Chat Moss. Like a funeral procession and the brass band ordered to remain silent, the trains continued to Manchester beneath grey skies and drizzle. But there was still a very long way to go. Probably the biggest hurdle along the route was here, about two thirds of the way along and still 10 miles from the city centre of Manchester. This is Chat Moss and for miles and miles is natural bogland. Now over the years it's mostly been drained and claimed for farming but in the early 19th century this was still very much a massive bog. Any attempt at laying a typical railway bed here would fail because it would all just sink. The crossing here was ingenious. They sunk huge amounts of lumber and heather into the earth with stones until the foundation was solid enough to lay a track down. It took weeks and weeks, yet even today the track technically floats. So welcome to the River Irwell. Um, just outside Manchester. Now originally they wanted to have the terminus of the line on this side of the river in Salford but there was objections about the site that they picked um, plus George Stevenson and the railway um, company wanted to get actually into Manchester as close to the heart of Manchester as they could so it was decided the decision was taken to cross this the last major obstacle en route and this is what they came up with this is George Stevenson's original viaduct, built in 1813. It's beautiful to look at. Um, and like most things on this route as well, it was technically a world's first. In this case, the world's first viaduct to cross a major river. Um, and again, it's all made out of sandstone. It's just a beautiful, wonderful thing to look at. Now, today we're used to seeing this type of thing. Again, this point comes up. We're used to seeing this as part of the background to our urban world but imagine seeing this back in the day just like the Sankey viaduct but imagine seeing this it would have seemed so futuristic um, yeah 
just such a, like a wonderful thing. This type of thing excites me. <laughs> and if you look up there, on the keystone of this arch, uh, underneath are carved the letters G and S, uh, which is very, very likely uh, going to stand for George Stevenson. Um, and it's just little things like that. I love stuff like that. When you, when you know what you're looking for, you know where to look. It's just a very, very sweet moment. Now, sadly, the construction of the viaducts wasn't without its trouble too. Uh, in fact, 12 men actually lost their lives um, on a boat that sank uh, as they were making their way to the cofferdam, which is um, where the stanchion is there in the middle, which is the foundation of that stanchion. Um, so they, they drowned in the river. And back in those days, not many people could swim. And even if you could swim, I, I suppose, it's still very, very dangerous. So um, yeah, it wasn't without its uh, tragedies. So actually this was hidden from view um, for quite a long time, 150 years, because in 1866, around 1866, they built another bridge um, just here, right next to it, called the Gerda Bridge, known as the Gerda Bridge, um, because the Liverpool Road um, site over there was expanded uh, to accept more goods traffic, and so they needed another line into the, the site. So they built another bridge, the Goods Bridge, and it hid Stevenson's Bridge from view all the way up until a couple of years ago now, I think, when they started constructing this, the Ardsall Cord, um, which is the first link, famously the first link between Piccadilly Station over there and Victoria Station up there. Um, and to do that, they had to knock down the Gerda Bridge. Um, and they also had to cross and kind of ruin a little bit the old original line over George Stevenson's Bridge. But moaning aside, um, yes, the also cord allowed us at least to see once again George Stevenson's original viaduct. So. <laughs> But not least, the railway line had to cross Water Street, which is this, which was a busy thoroughfare at the time. Um, now this bridge here isn't the original bridge. This was built in 1904, but the original was a very grand affair with 11 Doric columns on either side, uh, making it a very grand, like the rest of the line. Um, it had a, a bit of character, a bit of posh character to it. Um, now, obviously they're not here anymore, the columns, but there are footprints of the columns, um, sort of honoured here, in these uh, imprints down here. Eleven on either side of the road. Um, yeah, now it's a shame they actually demolished that original bridge and replaced it with this one. Um, because it's one of the only um, major redevelopments along the entire line. Most of the line is still very original today. This is probably the biggest... Uh, redevelopment of the line. Now this is a bit of a shame. At 3pm that day, the Northumbrian made its second arrival in Manchester, this time leading the other engines and carriages. Um, and this is where it arrived, Liverpool Road. And of course it's still very much here today, but it looks like a, a Georgian townhouse, doesn't it? Two stories high, um, with a ticket office under there. Now, the reason it looks like that is because nobody knew what a train station was supposed to look like. So they just made it a grand contemporary building of the day. Of course, the reason it's two stories high is because the railway line is actually up there in level with the, the first floor, with the ticket office, like I said, underneath. Now, the reason for that is because they had to clear the Irwell at such a height that the line was higher up where the viaduct is.
And this is the warehouse that was built beside it, today called the 1830 Warehouse. So this is where the procession arrived that afternoon, but as they entered Manchester, a hostile crowd greeted them, pelting the carriages with stones and vegetables. Mostly the crowd were weavers, angry at the Prime Minister's involvement in the Peterloo Massacre and his support for the Corn Laws. And they were described as ragged with unshaven beards and bare necks. The Duke of Wellington was so fearful of the crowd that he stayed within his carriage and urged the trains to return to Liverpool as soon as possible. So after only an hour and a half, the carriages were reloaded and the procession pulled out. It took so long for the majority of the engines to sort themselves out in Manchester that by the time they were halfway home, it was getting dark. None of them were fitted with lamps and so they were forced to travel even slower. Now yes, this is the same Duke of Wellington who's famous for his victory at the Battle of Waterloo, but this just goes to show how deeply unpopular he was as a Prime Minister up and down the country. He was an aristocrat who didn't really care about the working poor. Now as the trains made their journey back to Liverpool, the crowds waiting along the line to see the, the procession were more and more uh, agitated, more cold, impatient and crucially more drunk. Objects were thrown at the trains as they passed by and somebody even put a wheelbarrow on the line ahead of them. It was 10.30pm when the trains finally made it back to Crown Street Station where they had begun the journey earlier that day. They were a whole six and a half hours behind schedule. It had been a horrible rainy day full of testing times and a horrific accident. But that accident forced the opening of the railway to become an international headline putting the idea of mechanised transport to the public mind for the first time. Passenger services ran between the two cities the following day and after just one year it had already carried half a million passengers. The Duke of Wellington lost his job at the Prime Minister two months later and spent the rest of his lavish life hating railways, moaning that they would encourage the lower classes to travel about. Rocket meanwhile was never really used again for passengers, superseded by other engines such as Planet. But it managed to survive, and seeing it in person was definitely worthwhile. So there you go, the story of the world's first proper railway journey, which despite a catalogue of problems, still went on to change history. Thanks very much for watching, please like and subscribe, it really helps the video. Um, other than that, thanks so much, and I'll see you next time. Bye.